Done and done. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. We are on the Sales Startups and Side Hustles podcast. And today we have an incredible guest who is a mother of two. She is a rainmaker. She's been employed as a head of sales. She has brought in a sales director for HubSpot. And she's now a CEO and founder helping business owners unfuck their business. And that's right. I said that in the title. Put the kids to bed for this one. We're going to have some fun as she is the CEO and founder of Candid Maven, helping business owners and founders get out of their own way, understand their brand and generate sales and client acquisition strategies. It's an incredible pleasure to have her on the show. And I welcome Miss Joanne Schonheim. Joanne, thanks so much for joining us. I am so excited to have you here. How did you get started in this whole sales world? Thanks, Walt. Um, and lovely to, to be here today. Um, I have been in sales, like most salespeople, uh, got into it accidentally, um, ended up being, um, headhunted straight out of uni to be a buyer for a fine jewelry company. Um, so that's how I got my, um, start in terms of like the retail world. Um, understand that that is sales in terms of like what it is that you're selling. Um, but went to live overseas for a few years and came back, um, and ended up starting my own business. It was a retail, super hyper, hyper niched business um, and did that for almost eight years. And so being at the call face and dealing with the general public, I, I joke that I literally met every man and his dog um, and dealt with all the crazies out there and uh, learned how to um, get to the bottom of like what the problem is that people were actually trying to solve and learned that ability to adapt your communication style and to be able to build trust and rapport really quick and position yourself as the, the trusted guide that has the solution and is an expert in, in their problem. Um, and then being able to close and be able to ask for the money. Cause I find uh, a lot of salespeople really struggle to ask for the money. Mm. Um, and when they're um, rejected as in like they lose the sale, they take it personally. So I learned all that stuff the hard way through eight years of um, being public facing with the, with the general public. Um, and yeah, that's how I got into sales, straight into the deep end uh, and into the fire. So I think something that you said there is is interesting. You like you were able to um, get to the root of the problem and then ask people for money. And I I feel like as we talk to founders, we you know startup people and pe business owners, entrepreneurs globally, um, they know what they do. You know, I can say to somebody, what is it that you do? And they're passionate about it. They love what they do. Um, but then it's turning that, what do I do, into how does that solve your problem? And then importantly, and what we're going to spend a lot of time on our call today, turning that into a sales opportunity. Is that kind of, when we spoke just before we turned the microphone on, the the idea of Candid Maven, your your current uh, um company where you're taking business owners and you're helping them create those lead gen opportunities. Is that your baseline? You want to help people understand what they do, get out of their own way and, and create that message to market? So yes. And I think there's something really key that you just said. And this is the, this is the differentiator. Most business owners or salespeople that I know have this, this approach, which is I have this widget or I do this magic thing yeah. and everybody should want my magic thing or everybody should want my help. And so they think that their job is to say, look how amazing my magic thing is. And I'm going to convince you of all the ways that my magic thing is you, the next best thing since sliced bread. And I think that's the fundamental flaw in the logic and the approach, which is, it is not about you and your magic thing. No one gives a fuck about you. No one cares how good you are. No one cares how shiny it is. It's irrelevant because that approach is saying, I have something and I'm going to try and sell it to you. Mm. My approach is it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with how good I am. And it has nothing to do with how shiny the magic thing is that I'm selling. It's what are you struggling with? What do you want and currently don't have and what's in the way? Because if you could get it by now or you, you could have discovered that solution by yourself, you would have. So there's something in the way. So let me ask you a, a few questions to understand what it is that you're actually trying to get to and what have you tried up until now and what hasn't worked. And again, what's in the way. And so everything that I do in terms of a sales approach, and even from a marketing perspective, is empathy-led. 
where the focus is entirely on your prospect or your customer. It has nothing to do with you. All you're trying to do is get to the actual source of the problem. And a lot of the time, customers are trying to solve the wrong problem. And that's why they're in the fucked up position that they're in. And so mm. I spend more time diagnosing and going further upstream to identify where the source of the issue is, because typically they come to you trying to solve a symptom. And that's why no matter what they do, it still doesn't work because they're, they're looking in the wrong direction. So if after diagnosing the, the right problem to solve, if the shiny object or the thing that I have can help fix that, well then great, let's put together a plan of, of what we're gonna do next. And again, you need to be positioned as the guide, the trusted guide as being an expert in their problem. The sale is like an afterthought. It's the end result. And by then, if you've done your job really well, you're not selling them anything. They're coming and asking, can I buy it, please? They and already... then the price and whatever is just a formality of like, this is where I sign on the dotted line or here's my credit card. Yeah. So it's a completely different lens that I look at the 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 transaction. In fact, it's not a transaction. It's actually a relationship. It's a it's a power dynamic where you sit on the same side of the table as your prospect or customer. You put the problem in the middle, you look at it together and you solve collectively. And obviously you're supposed to know more than they do in terms of um, helping work out what the solution is. But the sale is just a byproduct. It's not the energy with which I enter the discussion. Cool. I love it. So I, I, I'm going to come back to that a little bit more because I feel like I'm diving into that problem solving approach for a, for a business owner. And I really want to focus on when should somebody um, come and speak to you? How do they know they have a problem? But before we get there, let's go upstream a little bit from that that concept, because I feel like um, as a salesman, I've done years and years of sales, you know, everybody that's our listeners, they're, they're selling every day. We hope if you're not what are you doing? Get out there and sell some more stuff. That's the only way. Selling you're not eating. Yeah, right. Exactly. So I've done a fair bit of it, but I think taking the approach that you're talking about, finding diagnosing, what, what's the problem, Mr. Customer? How can we help you solve it? I believe is so, 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 so valuable. But what do you say to the people that, that are saying, well, I can't afford to do that with everyone. I'm going to kind of see if I can put words into your mouth there. I think it's more like you have to be approaching the right people in the first place, right? Correct. So that's where qualification Right. is so key, right? So again, like when I help um, founders build a lead gen engine, the first thing that I look at is qualification. The first thing that you want to be doing out of the gates is to be yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, in terms of the people that you're either approaching or are approaching you. And that's otherwise you're just going to book getting... out, right? You, like you're not even like you're going to book out with time wasters and people that aren't even part of your Correct. solution. You, you need to make sure that you're you're speaking to the right people. Correct. And so that all, again, going further upstream, that all starts with getting super clear on your ICP, on your ideal customer persona, and not bullshit like they're male and they're 25 and they live on the East Coast of the US. Like demographics essentially is pretty much like useless. It's what's the problem that they're struggling with? What are their values? And what are their buying beliefs that they have? And that's why, again, it's like the, and so I was saying to you before um, we started recording, I get real deep, real fast. I skip all that top layer stuff because it's it's mostly useless data, unless I can I can take a bit of that data and infer other things um, in terms of, you know, if, if it's this, then it actually means that there's, they believe this, this and that about them, for example. Yep. Um, but it's going from ignoring the external problems and uncovering the latent problems, which is their internal struggles. And then most importantly, what's their philosophical problem that they're actually trying to solve? So back to your question, um, qualifying goes back to identifying your ICP, getting really clear on that, then being able to qualify really easily in or out in terms of right fit, wrong fit. And then if they seem like they're the right fit, that would then mean that they were a market qualified lead. And then again, super importantly, another set of uh, of qualifying questions, which is, are they a sales qualified lead? Mm. So do they have the budget? If they don't have the budget, are they willing to create the budget? Um, and B, is this something that needs to be solved now? Is there necessity and urgency? And what's the cost of not solving it? Because we can all walk around with a pebble in our shoe, right? But- you know, if you've now got an abscess and your toe's about to fall off, 
well, now, now we've got a real issue. Stop now everything. it's an urgent problem. Yeah, now it's urgent. It. Exactly. It's on fire. So how many business owners, Joe, would you say are marketing incorrectly in terms of this creating this ICP? You know, <laughs> let's, they, let's, they, do, let's ask a different question. Yeah. How many business owners are even marketing? Wow, I'm so stunned by that. I sat in a um, I sat in a, a business community group. Like I was invited to come and speak at a at a morning group, you know, one of the breakfast meetings for business owners kind of stuff. And I simply asked, um, how many people in the room are are currently running ads? It's like less than ten percent. Everybody's just relying on word of mouth. What are you guys doing? So yeah, let's focus on that. How many businesses are even marketing? Um, somebody once told me that running a business without marketing is like winking at a blind horse. You know what you're doing, but they have no idea. So do you do you find that often that people are just sitting back waiting for the bell to ring, the door to open, they're not actually going to market? Yeah, because in in my experience, and this is um, back from working with Dent Global, which was a business accelerator, which showed people how to position themselves as a key person of influence to create warm inbound opportunities and establish themselves as a thought leader in their niche industry, um, is that people typically aren't marketing because th typically people get into those businesses in the first place because they were a great technician in a big corporate or whatever, pushing their five buttons. They were the best at what they did. Um, and they realized that they could go out on their own and they could start a business. So they ended up being sort of like an accidental entrepreneur. And they've just propagated that um, employee mindset in terms of just delivering value, trading time for money. And that's why they get stuck in what's called um, the wilderness. And they aren't able to, to scale into what's called a lifestyle business. Um, and so their business starts with people who know them from their inner circle and then they do a really great job. So then it's obviously repeat business and then they tell someone else and now it's word of mouth. And the problem is, right, I think it's like 12% or 17% that you can only grow. And that's the difference between growing and scaling. Yeah. So you can only grow a certain percentage and you bump your head on a very low ceiling. And then especially now in this digital age, people who don't have a lead engine in place and aren't attracting net new business who are complete strangers, those business owners are now coming to me because what they used to do is no longer, it's still working, but it's no longer enough. And now they're literally starving because their pipeline, they're, they're not, they're so focused on delivering value now and just expecting new business to keep coming their way that they're not building pipelines six months out. And, it's and a so trouble. exactly. And then you end up obviously with like really lumpy um, cash and stress. Flow. I mean, like the, totally. the, that's where it, the, I, I find most entrepreneurs, that's where it comes from. They, they stress the, the people talk about the sleepless nights and the cash flow struggles and all that kind of stuff. And a hundred percent, it's because they're not filling that pipeline, right? It's just that they're not thinking six months out. We're going to need to warm up these people. We're going to need to have people in our pipeline. We're going to need to create conversations. They have no idea how to approach net new people. Yeah. And so back to your original question, I think most founders are not doing any actual quality, effective marketing. And they, and they usually have very little idea about sales. So even if they personally can close the deal, because again, it's part of their network. So that relationship and trust and rapport is already there, but they don't know how to start that with someone who's a, who's a stranger where their reputation their, and their personal brand doesn't enter the room before them. Mm. And so even if they're able to close their own deals, they really struggle when they bring on team because there's no actual sales methodology. There's no sales process. There's no sales playbook. And that's, again, something that founders are coming to me for going because they know I come from such a strong sales background. They're like, can you actually help me document this? Because let's say they've got a five-year exit plan. And I'm like, that is like the number one asset you need to be building. If you want to be able to successfully sell this company, you need to have a documented process and asset of a sales playbook because the, the moment you're extracted out of the business, if all the value is hinged on you, you're fucked. Yeah, right. Your business you, is worth almost nothing. You can't even go on holidays. You're you're done. You, the money will stop. So I, I think I answered that other question, Joe. When should a business owner come and speak to you? And it's like as soon as they realize that they've got that problem, they've got no new leads coming in, and they've got uh, they haven't got a documented sales process, and they just have no clear process of what they're doing. But let me let me wind back a little bit. Um, 
On your profile, as I was researching, uh, getting you onto the show, and again, thank you so much for the chance to say hi. One of the things that is prevalent about your brand and your marketing is that you have a very clear uh, distinction between sales and marketing. And you're, you are uh, very clear about the, p the piece that most business owners just completely mess that up. They, they, they put them in the same bucket. They approach them the same way. So um, what is it about sales and marketing being in different buckets that, that uh, drives you so crazy? So, and I was actually, the penny really dropped for me yesterday. Um, I was commenting on uh, a brilliant thought leader is actually a former client of mine, now turned friend, James Michael, who specializes in recruiting people's first sales salesperson who struggle with exactly this in terms mm -hmm. of bringing on, bringing on a salesperson and being sales ready because a lot of businesses are, aren't actually ready to bring on a salesperson. And even just working in HubSpot, working in, um, you know, CRM land, marketing automation, it just really came into crystal clear focus, which is, it's not that sales and marketing are in different buckets. Sales and marketing are absolutely in bed, bed together, but they are at different stages of the buyer's journey in terms of where you're at in the relationship. Yeah. So when it's net new business and it's a prospect and it's it's cold, they're a stranger. It's marketing's job is to attract them and warm them up so they and qualify them so they become a prospect. So that would be like marketing at the beginning of the of the buyer's journey. And there's the difference between a customer's journey and a buyer's journey. And I'm specifically saying the buyer's journey because again, empathy led, all about understanding and meeting where they're at, not where you're trying to shove yourself on them. So marketing starts in as a um, as a stranger. They st start and create that initial relationship, becomes a prospect, which is also then sort of uh, business development, which is sort of a hybrid between marketing and sales. When it's actually then a market qualified um, lead passed on to sales, who then sales qualifies them turns that prospect into an actual opportunity, tries to solve for what it is that they're trying to solve for. And if it's a, a good fit, then that person now goes from having been a stranger to now being a customer. And that relationship has developed and deepened and you should be collecting psychographic data about that lead the entire way, really getting to know them incredibly well until you're then a trusted business partner who then hopefully becomes a champion or an ambassador and continues feeding the funnel. So marketing and sales are not separate. They should be working hand in hand. They are absolutely in bed together, but marketing is like the one that goes out to the bar and tries to pick someone up. And sales is the one that actually like introduces them to the parents. Right. So it's the relationship nice of the buyer. Nice journey. analogy. I like it. I like it. So I think, um, as the as that journey goes through, you you mentioned something there, which I am guaranteed that ninety nine percent of our listeners are going to freak out about. You said all the way along that journey, you should be collecting psychographic data. What kind of information is important, and why should businesses be collecting that? And I mean, we can talk HubSpot or Salesforce or GHL or any of the yeah. other CRMs that are out there. Like irrelevant of the platform that you're using, what should they be collecting, and why should they do that, and how should they do that? Like, what's the what's the reason behind that? That's such a great question. I love that you asked that. Um, and just by the way, I'm not a tech person by nature. And so for me to have gone and worked for HubSpot, um, it speaks volumes of what HubSpot stands for. And even the whole concept of a CRM, a client relationship management tool. It's like where tech meets human <laughs> and meets feelings because everything about sales is about feelings because it, it's emotion. And so everything that I do with my clients is about eliciting emotion and extracting emotion and interpreting that emotion. So to answer your question about psychographic detail, the devil is in the detail. And this is where being great in sales is, a, is reflective of your ability to ask deep, insightful, meaningful questions and obviously you have to build the trust and rapport with that person to even have the permission to ask those questions and for them to open up. And so people used to say to me, holy crap, I've literally met you six minutes ago and I've told you more about myself than I have my friends and family or even my partner. Like, how did you get that out of me? And how I do that is because I am genuinely 
deeply interested and fascinated. I, everything is tell me more. And so you should be capturing that in a CRM, how many kids they have, do they have a dog? How did they start in business? Uh, what sort of coffee do they like? Like whatever information you manage to glean as a by the by, that stuff is super important because in order for a prospect to be willing to entertain having a conversation with you, because all of this is about starting a relationship and then deepening the relationship, is you have to, what, you, what we call, show me you know me. And so when you pay attention to that detail, and you show genuine curiosity, it's so rare that you will absolutely stand out and be a pattern interrupt. And the level of trust that you build and, and how how elevated that relationship will, will become very, very quickly, that's where the gold is. Because every human being wants two things only, to feel seen, and to feel understood. And that is the greatest gift you can give someone is to deeply, actively listen to them and make them feel seen and understood. Mm. So you capture all of that, which is a psychographic data, you put it into your CRM. And every time you have a conversation, you go back and you prep for that call before to make sure that you're completely across that, that person. And they're a person, not even a prospect or a customer. They're a person so that you can pick up where you left off and show and demonstrate that you're actually listening because there's nothing more annoying for, for a person to have to repeat themselves or to say, why are you saying that? I already told you three conversations ago that I've already tried that and it doesn't work. You, you weren't actually listening to me and then bam, you've just lost their trust and basically the sale's pretty much dead. Is it is it the same sales process, the same sales um, step by step system that we're talking about for for all levels of transaction? Like I, I'm getting the understanding that like we are talking about deep consultative style selling, and I've seen people do this in a one call scenario where they they go deep on the front end, they understand everybody, they're taking notes during that call. By the end of the call, it's a trusted friend and an advisor. That's that's an incredible thing. I've also seen where you you know coming from. Uh, your beginning retail, which is like walk in, buy something, walk out. So there's, is there a difference between the the way a sales cycle should be engineered depending on the level of business uh, of a product? So, of a, of a and company? this is this is the interesting thing. If you look at my career, and why I joke that um, I've never done the same job twice, but it all actually comes back to the same thing, which is a round table, and I've sat in all the different seats so that I understand all the different agendas and what's important to each one. And so that's how I know how to handle them all. So I've done everything from a tiny transaction of $1.40 in a retail environment, all the way up to giant, super complex 18 month sales cycle, working in tech, selling into corporate accounts where there are like 17 stakeholders. And it's just a clusterfuck of detail and project management. Did you get it? So again, Did you get the deal? <laughs> yeah. Nice. Again, back to understanding the buyer's journey and understanding how short or how complex and what are the um, buying beliefs and what are the qualifying criteria that a customer would have to tick all of those things off in terms of you satisfying in order for them to feel confident and have clarity. Cause that's the two other things they need to buy from you is confidence um, and clarity. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, the, the buying process is different depending on the sales cycle. So it'll just have way more steps for a longer one and there'll be way more stakeholders. And so your approach would be like a multi-threaded approach that you have hopefully more than one internal champion. You've identified who are the deal blockers who you need to like get on side. So it becomes highly strategic and real long game vision, but they all have the same thing in common which is no matter how long or short the buyer's journey is, everything that you do in terms of that sales cycle is earning the right and setting up and coming to an agreement of what that will be, of what's the next step. So all you're, you're not thinking about trying to sell your thing. It's 
just keeping the conversation and the relationship going. And that's why you really have to be patient and be able to see the the longer game and be able to hold off that need for instant gratification. Your instant gratification needs to be, I earn the right to the next step and I know what the next step is. We have an agreement on what that will look like. Right. The, the, the transaction's never going to happen unless the trust has first of all been, been given across the line, which is very, very you cool. You cannot accelerate it faster than uh, it's Mark McKins, who runs a great outbound um, company. And he talks about it um, as no faster than the speed of trust. Perfectly said. Yeah, absolutely. And it has to be conveyed before before any transaction will happen. Joe, how do you how do you help a business owner who has this fundamental core belief? Yeah, but Joe, I just really suck at sales. I'm just not a good salesperson. Right. Now you've got a company founder who's got a great widget who has a fundamental core belief that they suck at sales. How how do we help that person? How do we get them to to understand cool. that you know, sales are still possible? So I think the, I can pretty much guarantee you that anyone that thinks that they suck at sales has this faulty story and, and belief. And, and once you remove that belief and replace it with something else, the problem is largely solved. And that belief is that when you are selling that it's a personal thing. You're trying to sell yourself in some way. So either your services, your skills, the shiny widget that you built this, or the shiny widget that you represent. And if the sale then falls through, that person takes it personally and experiences it mm. as rejection. Mm. So the story they're living out of is if, if I lost a sale, that person rejected me. Yeah. And so they're like, oh, I don't have a thick enough skin for sales. I can't handle this. And they fall apart at the seams. Because mm. again, they're making the mistake. A, they're trying to sell something. So that's the the faulty thinking in the first place, which is switching that to someone, if they're the right fit and we have the right solution, they're going to ask to buy from me, which means then you can't ever be rejected because Either the person is asking to buy from you or they're not. And if they're not, it's not a right fit. It has nothing to do with you. There's nothing personal about sales. So once we've corrected that faulty story that they're living out of and that faulty belief, then they can stop taking it personally. We can then say, cool. So here is the process. Here are the decision-making criteria that a standard standard person, but a person goes through in terms of being comfortable and having clarity and confidence to to buy from you. Mm. It's really, really um, obvious. It's repeatable. It's the same. We're all wired the same in terms of the way that our human brains work. We all have a little reptile brain on our shoulder looking for red flags when we're communicating with a stranger, working out whether it's safe to proceed, whether we're going to be screwed over whether we're going to lose our money, whether we're going to be fired if we make a wrong decision in buying something that doesn't actually work. And I can actually explain the psychology behind each one of those steps. So when people work with me, again, I get real deep, try and explain and use a lot of storytelling and analogies so that way it's easier to to take on board and actually learn so that you understand in your bones it's now part of your dna it's truth you can't now forget it or unlearn it because it's now a a world view that you have and once you learn that like again you can't unknow it once i show you you can't unsee it (laughs) i love it and so it just shifts people's entire perspective I've seen that. Uh, and to help people along that same journey, I, I saw a, a YouTube short, which I thought was amazing uh, in my study of sales, where I, uh, it was done in the UK. So this guy had a, a pile, like a thick handful of 50 pound notes. And mm-hmm. he was just literally walking up to strangers and offering them a 50 pound note. And for those of you who are watching this on the video, the reaction was like this. But for those of you listening, it was like people were backing away with their hands in the air going, don't come near me, bro. Dude, I just want to give you 50 pounds. Like I'm giving you free money. And people are still saying no. And from a sales lesson point of view, 
if people will say no flat out to just money in the hand done for nothing, then of course you're going to need to to build the trust in order to earn that sale. So Can I tell you why they said no? Please tell me. They don't trust them. No, no, no. Tell me. So um, it's actually in, in uh, Robert Kiel, Kieldini, if that's who you pronounce his name, his book um, called Influence, mm -hmm. which is like a, a, a Bible that uh, a lot of sales and um, salespeople and marketers follow. It's um, it's a innate, again, how we're wired as humans, the um, social debt of reciprocity. So if someone gives you 50 pounds, fuck, I don't want 50 pounds from you because now – I owe you something. Right. You did me a favor or you gave me something that will stay as an open loop in their brain that until they're able to then repay that favor somehow or, or buy something from you or do something kind in return so that it's equal somehow to the 50 pounds, that literally causes pain for people. Wow. Because it's an unsolved problem. It's an open story loop that hasn't been closed. So when people automatically do this, they instinctively know, I don't want to go into debt with you. Wow. Amazing. I don't know who you are. I don't know what your agenda is. Something is very fishy and weird about this. But all I know is I don't want to enter into a transaction where I'm now indebted to you. Fuck off. Right. So that's that way we've got to get we've got to get that person who who um, feels like the sales rejection is personal to understand that it is a communication of 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 your service and an understanding of that service from the other person, from the client, from the customer, so that there's no debt. It's like I deliver this and you pay me for it, and it's a great transaction. Um, and if at any it time it has to be a fair, and that's the thing, the fifty pounds, the 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 mistake that that experiment it, um is based on is fifty pounds is too much, right? But if he'd gone and said, "Here's a stress ball," people, people would have taken like, "Okay, cool, I'm happy to take something that probably costs two pounds." That's a debt I'm willing to wear because it's not significant enough that someone's going to genuinely expect me to repay them. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. So I think we, we're talking about um, finding people and allowing them to make sales, create new customers. Uh, I, I love that, the um, net new customers. That's a great um, comment that I haven't, haven't ever heard before. Net new customers. How many new business contacts are we going to drop into our funnel this month and how are we going to process them through a, a specific series so that we can organize them and work with them to becoming a customer along that way joe do you find that a business owner needs to be a more communicative with their customer database do they need to create podcasts and youtubes and social media posts is that part of business these days love that you asked that question um and it's funny because as i said to you um the microphone that i uh, connected this morning is a podcast microphone, which was nice. gifted to me a year ago with the intention of me starting a podcast. And I didn't start a podcast because a podcast is a great way to build an audience of highly engaged people, but it's typically terrible in terms of sales. So you'll have like people who are deeply passionately uh, fans of yours but it's not necessarily going to result in sales. And so if you're starting out, or even if you've been in business for a very long time and you're stuck in that in that um, low ceiling of, of just doing business of word of mouth and repeat business, and there are very few net new uh, customers coming in because you're not generating leads, in my experience, hands down, the most effective and efficient way to possibly prospect and bring in net new customers is through LinkedIn. Nice. And this is okay. why I've gone all in on LinkedIn. It's got over a billion users. It's the richest platform. It has all the decision makers, all the C-suite are on LinkedIn. It's no longer, oh, that's where you go if you're looking for a job or you want to post a picture once a year of like some business awards dinner that you went to and you're so proud of your team and then you tag 50 billion people and no one else other than those people like it. But LinkedIn is the most efficient and effective way to get your, not your company page, you as the CEO founder to get your name out there and start building your, your online brand and your online reputation with people that you would never ever have met and start connecting and building those relationships and allowing people 
to understand and see because you're demonstrating them your values so that way they can see whether they feel like they know like and trust you and in order for people to buy from you they need to have so many touch points i think it's google analytics that said 7114 which is like seven um, hours of content have consumed by you across 11 different touch points across four different platforms wow and so when you're showing up on linkedin every day or every other day the amount of touch points that you're getting with those prospects you're just absolutely accelerating that relationship and shortening that sales cycle and in my experience i found that the people that end up in my dms which is where i end up closing pretty much all of my deals are people that have never engaged on any of my posts. Wow. They've not liked it. They've not commented. I've never heard of them before. But this entire time, they've been they've consuming been my content and, and going through that sales cycle themselves of do I think she is an expert in my problems? Do I trust her? There it is. Does she seem like that someone I would want to have a coffee with? Do we share similar values? Do I like her communication style? And does it look like she actually knows what she's doing? And then bam, they, they appear in your DMs and they're pretty much ready to buy. They're, they're coming crazy. to you with a buyer's question and, and, and uh, able to engage a relationship there. I know um, Arnik Singhal was, was uh, fascinating for me when he was talking about um, using social media and he did millions of dollars worth of experimenting and, and came back and said, um, do not sell on social media because that is the fastest path to a an empty bank account and uh, it's not what it's built for. And so uh, Arnik was talking about using social media for exactly that, letting people trust you, know you, understand who you are, what you relationship do. Relationship building, all starting a conversation, building a relationship. And when they come to you in social media, then they have engaged with you already, as you said, across multiple content. Now, I know there's millions of different courses out there on, on LinkedIn and and building your profile. And and I one of the things that you offer people is their ability for, for you to do an audit on their profile. So guys, you can go to LinkedIn and, and you can search Candid Maven. You'll end up with uh, Joanne's page, but better search uh, Joanne Schonheim and I'll make sure that that link is in our show notes here as well. So you can you can connect with Joe. You can, you can understand exactly how she's using this medium to do, ex to do what we're talking about here. What I was going to say was though, there's a million courses on LinkedIn and social media marketing, all that kind of stuff. I think probably the most common question people are going to ask is what should I post? Now I, I have a, a secret weapon, which is chat GPT, but do you have, and literally just going to chat GPT and going, I'm in this space. What should I talk about today? And like getting 20 ideas and oh great. There's one I can, I can turn the camera on and record a couple of minutes easily. Do you have a, a preferred way of scheduling or creating that, that calendar of content, Joe? Absolutely. So this is why my tagline is founders, let's unfuck your brand messaging. Because in order to unfuck your brand messaging in the first place, you need clarity. And clarity is the hardest, but most valuable thing you can ever have. Because when you have clarity, all of your resources and time and attention that you're pouring into what you do is pulling in the same direction. There's nice. no leaking of energy. There's no splitting of focus. Mm. And so in this digital age, the most powerful and again, cost-effective and efficient way to do it is to have such an incredibly clear signal that the other half of the magnet picks up on your signal that you're sending out and whoop, finds you. And that's how you build your tribe. So the point is, just like what I spoke about with marketing and sales earlier, getting clarity on your ICP, on your ideal customer persona. Who are they? Literally, they have a name. They are a person. So it's Andrew and he is in blah, blah, blah. And these are his buying beliefs and this is how he operates and these are what his values are. And these are the other products that he typically buys. And this is what he believes in. So that way you have that literally one person in mind of who's the ideal customer that if you could have a hundred more Andrews, you'd be like sitting pretty. And then you create messaging and content speaking to Andrew. And because you have clarity on Andrew's deepest pains and his goals are the things that he wants to achieve, your content needs to be addressing that. So that when Andrew comes across your content, he goes, is she talking to me? 
because that's literally like everything that's going on inside my head. That is exactly how I feel about that. And that's exactly the language that I use to describe how I feel about that. That's how I came up with the tagline of founders, let's unfuck your brand, your brand messaging. Because the people that come to me, A, they, I can't help them if they don't realize they have a problem. And that problem needs to be intense, whether it's unbearable. So that they're, they're, they're ready and they're willing to solve it now. And it's not negotiable. They cannot continue a moment longer knowing that their brand messaging is fucked. So they don't know how to unfuck it. They just know it's fucked and they're like, please, someone help me. So even though I'm not doing the typical formula of like, I help founders do this so they can have more of that. Like that's just a yawn fest, but it also attracts the type of customer that I want to work with, which is someone who has probably hidden courage and and does have the ability to be bold but again they haven't like kind of given themselves permission or they're kind of overthinking it and so they come to me because they know that they need more of what I have and that that's probably the thing that's in their way so I'm not going to make them like me but I'll elevate them 10-15% from where they are which again unblocks them and gets them to where they need to be so back to your original question in terms of creating content, super clarity on what's that one person that if you had a hundred more of them, you'd be so happy. Getting really deep into the things that that keep them up at night and the language and the emotions that they used to describe those problems. And then you literally create content talking to that person. So when they see it, they go, she's talking to me. I have to speak to her. Nice. I like it. And demonstrating again, exactly walking the talk as, as you do there, Joanne. So um, creating that content in, an, in a space that allows the right prospects to connect with you so that you can bring them into your, into your world. Again, capturing that data about them and, and conversing with them in a way that um, transmits trust, you know them, you understand them. And then sales becomes, as we said, almost like irrelevant. It's, it happens the naturally. Buy the buy. The, the transactions already happened. I know, I understand what you're doing and where you're at, what your pain points are. I have a solution that solves it and I'm passionate about it. Let's get together. And, and as you said, I love that analogy as well. Sitting on the same side of the table with the problem in the middle, both looking at it rather than from opposite sides, uh, attacking different things. So Joe, I think um, there was something there that you, that you mentioned as well, where a lot of business owners or startup founders, let's go with that, a lot of entrepreneurs um, have come from a tech skill set. So they've gone, mm -hmm. they've gone, I'm really good at X and I work for this company and I'm tired of trading my life and all of that kind of stuff that entrepreneurs um, go through. And then they say, I'm going to go out on my own and I can do this. And they end up um, being a techni technical person in a business related world. Um, is there, first of all, is there, a, is there a person that should stay an employee? Like, is there somebody that uh, for me, I go, no, I, like everybody should be, you know, everybody, but I understand that's not for everybody. Right. So in your experience, should some people just never be a business owner? And I'll follow up that with a second question of when they take that plunge, is there a, a fast path to the skill sets they're going to need to create their own future? Do you believe? So first of all, oh. should, should some people just stay an employee and never take the plunge? But the ones that do, what should they do to create that more rounded approach as a business owner? Cool. So great questions. Um, if you don't have an appetite for risk and you're not willing to back yourself and you don't have trust and faith that if you fall off the tightrope, you will find a way to get, to pick yourself back up and get back on the horse and keep going. And if you don't have an imagination, if you can't imagine what could be and all you can see is what's in front of you and you need to be told what to do and you want to just color inside the lines and, and paint by numbers and just be a, a good, if you just want to be a safe pair of hands, then you should probably not be an entrepreneur because it's not for the faint hearted and it takes a significant amount of grounded optimism and you also have to have the you have to have an abundance mindset so i once i once interviewed an entrepreneur 
who want who wanted to be an entrepreneur and she had started a business, but she had she came from um she was a merchandise planner, which is like procurement and buying. And we met, and she's like, Oh my God, I just did my books and and I saved um I got my costs down to like seven percent. And I was like, What? I've never heard anyone talk about growing their business and speak about it from the lens of how much money they saved. What the actual fuck? I don't care how much money you saved. How much revenue did you generate? So it's it's all about do you have the ability and the imagination and the desire and the energy to create more and that I think that's really what it comes down to are you an amplifier can you create energy can you create something from nothing or do you have to inherit everything if you have to inherit things and you're not a builder please for the love of god stay safe and stay as an employee because if you've got a, a mindset of the safety officer versus like the artist two totally different and stay uh, an employee because the entrepreneurs the entrepreneurs need you so stay as an employee we love you exactly we can't all be entrepreneurs right. like the world would fall apart if we were all going around building shit <laughs> it'd be so, a, it'd be a your second place. question sorry mm. Yeah, no, it'll be a struggling place if we were all like getting into that creative zone, like nothing, there would be broken shit everywhere. Nobody would get be getting anything done. <laughs> Someone needs to be the safe pair of hands. Right, and we need you, yeah. Exactly. Um, to answer your second question, which is if somebody does want to get into it, what's the most kind of efficient way to mm. acquire that skill How do they get skill those skills? Like that's, it's, a, it's a big jump. Totally. So there's a really great way of leapfrogging it and it's through the power of partnerships and your environment. So it's, it's, you know, the whole Ubuntu thing of like, if you want to go fast, go along, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So it's, what do I, first of all, play to your strengths. Don't try and be good at everything. Don't waste your time trying to master shit that, that de-energizes you because you will make way less pro progress. You don't need to be great at everything. You can outsource or again, partner with people who are already great at that, who've already nailed it. Don't waste your time learning something that's already been um, solved. And so it's stand on the shoulders of giants. Mm. So partner with people who have what you want and have it in abundance, but don't value it to the same level as you do because they just take it for granted and you're not competing with each other. So it's potentially the same customer base, for example, but you solve totally different parts of their problem. And so there's no, um, it's not competitive. And then the other thing, in addition to partnerships is the environment. So be very, very careful about your environment and who you spend time with. Because again, being an entrepreneur is so freaking hard. Like you don't need naysayers. And yes, you can have people that kind of bring you back down to earth a little bit, but you can't have anyone that's going to come and literally pour water all over you know this tiny little fire that you've just managed to start the embers you need to be hanging around with amplifiers that can can grow that fire into a bonfire and are going to be cheering you on and help you and collaborate and mentor you so hang out with people that have already done what you want to do and that what you want to do is normalized so if you want to publish a book, hang out with other people that have published a book. Don't hang out with your friends from high school and sometimes even your partner or your family where for them, the alarm bells go off of like, that's that's dangerous. You don't know how to do that. There's no data to say that you'll you'll be able to do this successfully. So be super mindful of the company you keep, what you share with people and get around energy amplifiers partner with people that already have what you want in abundance and are willing to share with you or collaborate and get into an environment where being an entrepreneur, taking those risks, doing those things and being at that level of success is totally normalized. So be the poorest, dumbest person in the room. 
find that room. I love it. And there's plenty of those rooms around, by the way, guys, like you can, there's so many groups on Facebook and on LinkedIn where you can, you can be part of a community for free and you can get that training and interaction with people and hanging out That's with LinkedIn. So great. Oh, it's amazing. And, and there's so Build many great tribe. environments for it. It's so good. So Joe, I think I can hear the passion that you have for entrepreneurs and, and founders. I can hear the passion that you have for sales and creating great uh, client acquisition strategies. And I can really, I can feel that. So what's happening for you? Like where will we see you over the next sort of six to 12 months? What's what's happening um, in, in your business and in your life and in your growth? Cool. Um, so I'm all in on LinkedIn. Um, I actually said to my partner last night, it's so funny. He was teasing me endlessly because I sounded like the biggest dork. Because I work remotely, um, I basically like am in company of myself every day. And the only time I meet anyone is if I go to my local coffee shop and and see my local community and and chat and meet some business owners, whatever they're by, um, you know, by accident, um, incidentally. And LinkedIn is especially for a salesperson or someone from marketing, we love novelty and we love meeting new people and starting new relationships. And so I described LinkedIn like turning up every day to a new party where you're just constantly meeting new people and starting new conversations and being let into conversations that you would never have access to. Like yesterday, I commented on a post um, from the CEO of the Telegraph UK and I put a, a valuable, insightful comment and it was interesting enough and of value enough that she commented and then a whole bunch of other people went and loved it. I'm like, this is what I'm talking about. You get access to people that you would never, ever have access to. You, It's a total meritocracy. So you can engage and start a relationship with anyone if what you share, again, is about them is about providing and sharing value for them of what's in it for them, not talking about yourself. You can share mm. your own experiences, but it's all with the lens of how does this contribute to this conversation? How is that? How, how am I leaving that person better off than I found them? How have I, how have I genuinely added um, value? So in terms of what's next for me, I'm all in on LinkedIn. I am absolutely loving this. I, I actually think and it's, it's just a, an internal belief. I, I don't know what the details will look like, but I have a really strong feeling that this next 12 months is going to be incredibly um, exciting and that some really juicy opportunities are going to come my way because I can feel that I'm building enough net new networks and building a, a net new reputation, which is my personal brand, um, in enough different communities, but all with the same thing, which is they are my tribe in mm -hmm. that all of those connections are values-based. So have do those people align with the things that I hold dearest to me in terms of what's important? Everyone else that doesn't, I am not interested in. You either are what I classify as a good human who deeply values connection and relationships and is generous of spirit and again has a growth and abundance mindset those are my people i don't care where they're from i don't care which industries they're in only good things can come from hanging around people that share your values so Ah, it's exciting. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'll oh, be there I love it. every I love day. It. We're going to see you every day out there, Joe. So guys, um, I'll, again, I'll make sure that the, the link's here in, in our show notes, but it's uh, Joanne Schonheim on, on LinkedIn. Um, you'll find her her page with Candid Maven, but just Google uh, or, or look for, for Joanne. So Joe, I, I love the message. Thank you so much for, for the opportunity to come and speak. Guys, you've heard from Joe and Joe is literally here to help business owners, founders create new sales and opportunities and growth strategies for their business. Um, and I believe that, her passion comes across in this in this uh, interview so, so, so clearly. And guys, if you've got an opportunity in front of you where you have a business that you're proud of, you want to get started, you want something that's going on forward, I think there's nobody better on LinkedIn right now than Joe to be able to follow along and drive your own brand messaging forward and unfuck your business as you're going, unfuck your brand messaging as you're getting that started. Um, so Joe, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to to hear from you and to understand what it takes for business owners to create that, that own future. Um, and 
I can't wait to see what you're doing. I think uh, we're going to be you. watching you explode on LinkedIn. I can't wait to see you um, uh, hosting some pretty big summits there and, and talking to that tribe and check back in with us and let us know how you're doing. Thank you so much. I have really enjoyed this and thank you for an incredible opportunity. And I can't wait to meet your, your community. Um, if they're anything like you, which I'm assuming they are. Um, yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to expanding my tribe. We'll Thanks have some so much. fun. See you on the flip side. Thanks so much, everyone. See you on the next one. Thanks, Paul. Bye.